Maybe I have another question. Oh, we started. Are we on? We're on now. Um, okay. Got one person's joined us. Okay. We'll wait for everyone else to get get in before we get started. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Maybe it'll just be one person. <laughs> Hello, person. <laughs> <laughs> currently at five so I'm thinking maybe not just one person but I'm sure we'll have a good time even with just one <laughs> then 15 people hello to everyone who's just joined us we'll get started in maybe a couple of minutes but yeah give it a few minutes so people can continue to join oh, gosh have you had a very busy day today me oh yeah, yeah. I've just been in the British Library all day, um, but I always end up doing a lot less there than I think we'll get done. Like it's, it's like a profoundly <laughs> unproductive space for me um, these days. But yeah, it's, yeah, I've been I've been up for a while. So yeah, I quite like the British Library. I've only worked there twice, but it's quite an an interesting space. Uh, it's like really good people watching like it, um, and. <laughs> Compared to, I always find people in London like spectacularly well dressed, and I, I'm a bit stunned by it. So you know, it's been a long time just kind of staring. Um, but yeah, I really love it. It's my favorite place in London. I really love it. I think where my favorite place is. I'm not sure it's my favorite, but maybe it'll be up there. Hello to everyone who joined. Hello Helen and hello Stephen. If you've just joined us, yeah, feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know where you've joined us from. Um, we'll give it a couple more minutes and then get going. You know, the only thing that I don't like about the British Library is that you can't take water into the reading rooms, which I find very frustrating <laughs> because I'm already really bad with re with drinking when I'm doing things and then there's absolutely no reason to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the guards, you can get some pretty aggressive guards. Um... <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, I had one yesterday. I've been here since um since yesterday, um and yeah, I had one who like seemed like he wanted to pounce on me for walking into the room. Like I just absolutely had something in my hand. I can remember what it was. That I'm not supposed to have. He's like, "Hey," <laughs> as if he's a god in a bank or something like that. I think I got that the first time that I went in and didn't realise that the rule was no water and thought it was no other liquids and then <laughs> got caught as I was leaving the room with the water and told off for the fact that I had the water in there. <laughs> I didn't spill anything, so it shouldn't have been an issue, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. They take, they take the... <laughs> right then, hello from London. We've got a few people who've joined us from rainy Birmingham. I'm in rainy Birmingham today and it's just not been very fun. But I imagine it's a bit rainy everywhere. Okay, I think we've got quite a few people, so we'll get started. And if, if anyone else joins us throughout, then they'll catch us at whatever point we started. <laughs> so, hello everyone. I'm Kais. I'm a publishing assistant here at the Emma Press. If you all don't already know about us, the Emma Press is an independent publishing house specialising in poetry, short fiction, essays and children's books. It was founded in 2012 by Emma Diane Wright and is now based in the Jewelry Quarter, which I imagine was also very rainy today. We're obviously here today celebrating the release of Malachi Makatosh's new book, Parables, Fables, Nightmares, which published today. Two coffees, excellent. Today, so that's very exciting. Kind of thought that we'd be, we normally do these a day or so after it's published. It's very exciting to get to do it actually on the publication day. So I will tell you a little bit about Malachi and then hand over Tim to tell you a bit more about the collection. I think he'll do a slightly better job than me. So Malachi was born in Birmingham in the UK, but grew up in the United States. His fiction and nonfiction have been published in the Caribbean Review for Books, The Guardian, The Independent and Comma Press's Book of Birmingham. He's received he is recipient recipient of British Library's Eccles Fellowship and a Royal Society of Literature Charles St Alban Award. I'm hoping I pronounced all of that right. <laughs> he was editor and publishing director of West Safari from 2019 to 2022, and currently te teaches English at Oxford University. And Parables, Fables, Nightmares is his first collection. So over to you, Malachi, to tell us a bit about the book. Okay. Um. Firstly, thank you everybody for for coming. Um, I thought maybe there might be two people on the call or something like this. Um, and then I was told that 30 odd people have signed up, um, which is kind of frightening, but I really appreciate you taking your time out to come and 
kind of watch this chat tonight. And um, also, I'll probably do this again at the end. Um, just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody at the Emma Press for kind of making this book happen. Um, yeah, everyone's been really wonderful. If you want to publish a book, publish a book with Emma Press. They look after you. Um, so uh, how do I describe this book? Um, I actually got some forewarning that this question was coming and therefore had time to prepare and still managed not to be able to think of how I would describe what I've done. Um, it's a collection of nine short stories. All of the short stories, I guess, in some way are almost experiments. Um, it's a book of attempts to wrestle with, I think, what it feels like to live now or in the relatively recent past. Um, and they all are stories which are kind of dancing around various similitudes. So kind of playing with realism, um, some are not very realistic at all, kind of dreamlike or irreal. Some are a bit closer to the standard, you know, uh, way of representing the world. But all the stories are kind of trying to do things with form to capture a feeling, an affect, uh, an experience of, of, of living now. Um, and all obviously filtered through my own imagination. So kind of my own take on you know what's what's happening um i think when i say that it can sound a little bit po face <laughs> but i think uh the collection as a whole kind of has quite a few different moods in it and one of the earliest conversations maybe we'll talk about how the book came to be published i had with the director of the emma press emma um was about how to structure the collection so i pitched it as one thing with a collection of, of works in it um, she asked me to tweak it a little bit. I wasn't really sure how to, um, to sequence the pieces. And she said to try to think of it, or she said like a, something very profound and insightful about short story collections, but that they need not, all the stories need not necessarily be sort of tonally consistent or using the same style, but that it can move like a mixtape or, or like an album. Um, and when I was putting the collection together and also writing new stories to add into the ones that I had submitted, I wanted to make it move like a good mixtape. I'm old enough to have made lots of mixtapes um, <laughs> over the years um, and how that kind of um, kind of kaleidoscopic turn that a nice mixtape has, right? Where you start with something that grabs your attention, you move through different moods and then you end with something that is that kind of leaves you that kind of lingers on in, 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 in your mind and in your memory. And that, that's what I tried to do with this thing. Whether or not I succeeded, I probably didn't. Um, that, that was the effort. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I understand the thing. I think that you absolutely did succeed. Um, I think you talking about it in that way, I've been trying to think about what my answer to that question would be of how would I describe this book and kind of the process of reading it. And I think that is exactly what it felt like. And I just wouldn't have been able to put it into those kind of words of being gripped at the beginning and then left questioning at the end and having a story that you kind of return back to and think, I just, just one more time and I'll kind of get it. And I want to stay with it for longer and kind of figure out what's happening. Um, I think that you've kind of brought me onto a question that I was thinking about when I was flicking through the book just before we got started. So obviously it's split into those kind of three books as you go throughout it. Um, that's kind of anyone who hasn't already read the collection or kind of had it in your hands. There are those kind of breaks as you go throughout. And I thought maybe that's meant to be purposely mapping onto the title with it being parables, fables, nightmares, but kind of hearing you talk a bit more about trying to fit it together like a mixtape and how those breaks fit into it a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think, so I would say that um as a kind of roundabout way to getting back to the question when I was an editor at, at Wasafiri and possibly people from there on the call and thankfully have no idea who's on the call um, I spent like probably far too much time trying to sequence the pieces of the magazine in the hope that it would be a pleasurable experience to read it from cover um through to editorial all the way through to the end knowing that nobody reads a magazine like that um and that's kind of what I wanted to do with this so I wanted it to be I mean, again, off the back of that conversation with Emma, for the story to be self-contained, but for the collection to feel itself like a whole, like, you know, again, like an album that you can listen to from beginning to end. Although there are various different singles perhaps like scattered through there. And the section breaks were almost like those moments, I, I mean, I didn't think of it this way at the time, but almost like, you know, the moments of silence between tracks or, you know, that anticipation of, a, of an alteration or, you know, in the old like 90s hip hop tracks that have like some really ridiculous and terrible skit that lasted far too long of, you know, 2008 Chicken Shop. 
or something like that, but <laughs> that like, enable you to to make that movement into the next section. Um, mm. And as far as is it parables, fables, nightmares? Is that how I, I can see the story is? I mean, not really. So I feel like the title, uh, in my head at least, kind of applies to all of the stories. Like all of them, I think, have elements of of all three things. Um, with maybe one exception. Um, but I think maybe the sequencing kind of facilitates thinking about what the stories in each section have in common, which I think they are kind of, the sections themselves are unified. Um, but yeah, whether section one is parable, section two is fable, section three is not, I mean, not quite for me, but uh, I guess that could work too. Okay. okay, I think that that is kind of the answer that I was expecting because when I thought if you split it like that, my next thought was, what's the difference between a parable and a fable? Mm -hmm. And do they overlap a little bit? Would you really be able to separate <laughs> it really cleanly like that? I'm not yeah. sure that you yeah. would. And nightmares definitely feature earlier than that, the kind of end <laughs> part of the book. Yes. And which which would you say is the exception? I'm curious to hear. Um, I think, so there's a story in the collection, which I thought I might read a bit later, called White Wedding which I think just doesn't really fit. And I did up until the 11th hour say um, to Emma and James who are working on the editorial on the book, like, does this fit? Like, should I, should this be in here? I don't know if it's the same mood. And they're like, no, 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 keep it, keep it, keep it. So it's in there and it's a very strange story. And it's a story I just wrote in a rush at, at one point um, some years back um, and then went back and sort of tweaked and tweaked. Um, but I think it's, it's, I guess it's kind of a fable in that it's the story that's the most, I think, kind of out there, <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the weird, that's the kind of outlier. But I feel, again, thinking of it like music, it's, you know, almost a palate cleanser that sets up what comes in the end, which I think are, are slightly like heavier stories. I am extremely glad that you kept that story. I think that's the first story that I read of the okay. collection before it was a full collection. Um, yeah, I think I think that's the first one. I felt I remember reading an examination, uh -huh. maybe quite early as well. And there was another one. So I know that there were definitely three, but why wedding one that really stuck with me when I was like, oh, I really right. want to read the rest of this book. So I'm really glad that you kept that one in there. Yeah, <laughs> you all really loved it. And I was like, I don't know, I don't even know if this works, but yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe now is a good time to pause. You might not be reading White Wedding now, but to have a little break for you to hand it over to you to maybe read a bit from the collection for us. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, uh, I, I would read, I, I, I would love to be able to begin at the beginning. So the story opens, the book opens with a, with a short short, which is untitled, but has a little asterisk at the top of it. Um, and, but I read that for a recording on YouTube, which I think is on the Emma Press channel. And we had to re-record it a hundred thousand times because I kept stumbling over it because I have braces. Um, so it's probably not the best one to read. So I'm going to actually read the second story, which is the um, uh, the oldest story in the book. So a story which was um, first drafted a very long time ago. I want to say more than ten years ago, um, but that I I kind of kept back, kept coming back to and back to and playing with over that that space of time. Um, there's nothing much to say about it. It's called Examination, and I'm just going to read the opening two sections of it. Um, so, Examination. And forgive me, I'm on an iPad, so my, my camera's over here, so I think I'm not making lots of eye contact, but I'm still looking at where people might be. Right. So, Examination, again. They slept together in the same bedroom, but no longer shared the same bed. She told him over a year ago, that it wasn't appropriate, her word, appropriate, and bought him a camp bed just to start and wedged it against the far wall. The arrival of the bed meant the loss of the bookcase from the bedroom, the books now stacked alphabetically underneath where he slept. They tended to wake up at the same time, her alarm clock bleeding to them both, parting each body up and out as it echoed. In summer, the noise rang with sunlight, in winter, the sound into dark. Today, it was set earlier than always, because today was today. The test. The boy lay awake. His eyes opened about an hour before they were supposed to, found the ceiling and rolled into his eyelids as he started doing his sums. He began with the easy ones, the ones he knew that he knew, then moved upwards into big numbers, three digits, four. He did as she taught him, checked his answers with subtraction, did everything twice, but then he got stuck, as always. 
He always got stuck. He looked down then across at her sleeping, over the distance from his bed to hers. In the first weeks of lying alone, he would, inevitably, wake up in the dark and suddenly feel cold, feel the idea slamming out of him that she decided to run away. He'd look across and in those first few weeks, months, panic and throw off his sheets to see her, sneak the few steps to her blanket and burrow in. She'd stir and mumble and move her hands, but if he pulled his knees into his chest and stayed silent, breathed even, he knew he'd spend the evening in her heat with her smile. Are you awake? She said to him now. No, he said, eyes open. Not yet. She made a noise, a yawn, slid up and slid up and back to rest her forearms, uh, slid up and back to rest on her forearms in bed. Can you boil me some water for tea? She said. Can I make the tea? Just the water. She breathed another noise, a sign or a, a sigh or a yawn. You make it too weak. I have to teach you. She yawned again, sat her back fully against the headboard, her arms up and then out and stretched. Her face twisted up and then her face at rest. Do you have to go, the boy said. Her arms slumped into her lap. I'm so tired. I don't know why I'm so tired. Mom. Of course, she said. Of course what? Of course we have to go. But why? Because we do. Her hands smoothed down her face, back through her, her hair, her hair everywhere. Because they all think you're something that you're not. And because of that, they think we're something that we're not. And we're going to show them. I don't want to show them, the boy said. She looked at him and yawned, yawned something he couldn't understand. And then the alarm went off. The subway. Every week it felt like a million miles into and out of the city. The walk to the subway, the walk to the apartment, the walk up the stairs. She'd met with his teacher so many, she'd met with his teacher so many times in the last two years that it turned into a second commute. Home, smear sandwich, check the answering machine, feed him, then drag him back to the bus, to the school. First, their tight smiles and small talk. Your trip? Oh, really? Your work? I have a cousin here. Coffee? Oh, tea? I'm not sure that we have tea. Then the warm up. We think your son is very capable. Then business. Eventually, even they felt the routine was too routine and wanted to break it, to cut to the chase. They'd actually say that. I want to cut to the chase, gesturing with clenched fingers. They're presenting themselves as no-nonsense and frank, as people who spoke the truth and expected it back. All the approaches aimed anyway at the same destination. Whether they claimed to think he was capable or not, what they wanted, why she was there, was for them to tell her the myriad ways that he'd failed. Every time she met them, eventually, a white paper of red lines, a quotation from a parent of another child, or his own admission, yes. He was variously inattentive, disruptive, unsettled, troublesome, agitated, overexcited, rambunctious, too vocal, under-motivated, uninterested, volatile, and once dangerous. Dangerous, she said. I don't say that very often, the woman said, tapping her pen on the desk between them. But that's the best word for the way he behaves. She would be called in to discuss his report cards, to discuss his, quote, harassment of girls his age, his refusal to stay in his chair, the wide eyes he directed everywhere except at the blackboard. She'd be asked what he watched on television, where he was in the few hours before she arrived back home from work. They'd question, ever so tentatively, whether his father, where his father was. He's nine now, they said most recently, softly. And for a boy his age, it is very important. She'd nod at them, take him home, scream at him sit him down with the school books on the kitchen table, just the two of them under the single bulb and teach him. Take him back the next week, walk, bus, walk, to the same old homeless man on a cart begging for change, the kids on Walkmans with skateboards, other women with their sons on bus seats reading thick books opened up on their laps. Just him, just her. That's it. That was brilliant, thank you so much. I especially love the way that that, sec that whole part begins, I think, with them waking up and the, are you awake? No, not yet, despite the fact that you are awake. Just I think that's exactly how I feel in the morning when anyone <laughs> ever asks me if I'm awake yet. <laughs> we, I don't know if you can see the chat, but Helen just said, wow, great reading, um, which I obviously really do agree with. <laughs> I guess you kind of said that this was written a really long time ago. Uh, I guess you've been... I think I've been working on the collection and kind of the stories in it over a really long period of time. How do you kind of 
think that your writing has changed a story like this versus one that was kind of written more recently and kind of I guess you returning to it time and time again over a long period of time as well how has that I guess changed that story and changed the entire collection in some ways yeah um that's a good question I think what would I say what's changed I guess I, I have over the time that I've been writing I've been writing for a very 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 long time <laughs> um to just now have a first collection I feel like a granddad um I I write in sort of two different modes the moods or have historically um, and very recently I've been trying actively trying to bring those two together so I write have written in a in a way that's kind of closer to realism like I said in the beginning and much more sort of serious I, su I suppose melancholic possibly and the story is kind of in that mode to an extent and then I write in a mode which is more sort of zany and ridiculous um, which is like the story I think I'll read at the end um, and I think when I first started out, you know, mood number one was dominant. And this is sort of written in that, that mood. Then I went through a period, you know, mid-career, like non-existent career, where everything was silly. And I was reading a lot of Nicola Barker and sort of Laurie Moore and kind of aping that style, I guess. And now more recently, I've been really actively trying to see is there a way to kind of unify those two. And I'm, I've been working on a novel for forever as well, 10 years, which is really trying very, very hard to, to put those two things together to, to evoke something. Um, or in the, in the hope that, you know, being able to, to, to track between the two is potentially, you know, has more emotional power than just staying in one mode or painting with one color predominantly. And this story has a bit, you know, some some silly, well, not silly, but some lighter moments in it too. Um, I guess the story is just very close to me. And the reason I, I came back to it and have continually come back to it is I think number one, I just really loved it. And I think there's certain things that you write and you can't get them quite right, but they still just linger with you. They just, you know, you carry them in your head and, and you think I was working on my novel this morning, which is a similar kind of thing, which I probably should have given up on ages ago, but I, I haven't. Um, where the characters almost become real to you in this really strange way that I think creative writers, fiction writers talk about um, this kind of the spooky aspect of writing, Norman Mailer called it, where, you know, you've invented somebody, but they feel as, 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 as you know, as flesh as some of the people you know, as flesh in fact sometimes more flesh than something people you know <laughs> or slightly opaque to you um and this mother and son were just there they felt full and they felt real and i just wanted to do a good job for them which is mad but that's how that's what it was so I just kept coming back and tweaking it and tweaking it and trying to refine it and and polish it and you know the story has changed as i've changed and and what matters about it has changed as i've changed as necessarily or what does um and although it was sort of a long time ago, it, it feels very current to me because, you know, it was finished in time to publish this. And the newer stuff, uh, you know, the newest story in this is, is uh, the story immediately after this one called The Ladder, which I finished, I think, either just before I submitted or in fact, after the deadline to submit. <laughs> I was like, wait, 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 I just want to change a couple more things. Um, and that is... I guess some of the newer stories that I have, like I've enabled myself to feel more comfortable with a story not having a traditional shape. Um, whereas I think with my earliest stuff, I, I really wanted to create stories that read like the stories I was reading, not, you know, really nice to round it off, that kind of New Yorker style where you, know, you get to the end, you're like, oh, what a beautiful and sort of Fabergé egg this person has not yes, created this. Um, and like, I'm not a beautiful Fabergé egg person. And, you know, trying to write that stuff is always a bit like, you know, writing with my wrong hand. Um, so the newer stuff I think is kind of a bit scrappier, a bit like more overtly experimental, a bit more me kind of trying to push myself to do new things um, in ways that are exciting to me, but which I think result in stories like the very last story in the collection, which is also quite new that maybe don't have that, that aren't as like tidy perhaps as, as a traditional short story, you know? So maybe the difference between like a pop song and something that's published or a song that comes out from some kind of random underground indie label or something like that, you know, like Taylor Swift can make a really beautiful, I guess, like compelling, very catchy song that, you know, it's over and you're like, oh, well done, Taylor, you, you did it again, versus, you know, something that is 
a bit more discordant and jarring and, and, and challenging, but kind of sits with you and, and maybe feels satisfying or I hope feels satisfying in, in a different kind of way. I have so many different questions based on all of that. Um, I'll try and think my, my, my first question when you, were, when you were speaking was you saying about the different writing styles. Do you think there is a kind of a reason why you kind of had that sh change as you were going through, like why you were more serious and then more more fun? I guess you kind of already answered what you think is the benefit of bringing the two together. Um, the, honest, the honest answer is failure, actually. So um, I, it's something familiar, I think, to everybody who writes. You submit things, people don't want them. They, you know, you get the nice rejection letter and then you write, you know, which is so, you know, anyone who writes about to write it, like maybe the writer's on the call, knows that there's the rejection, rejection letter. There's like the nice rejection letter and there's the exception, acceptance letter. And like you kind of eventually um, graduate to the nice rejection letter, which is like, we'd love to see more things from you in the future. Um, and I was, that's pretty much like where my, I felt with my first kind of stories, like I stalled, I, I was submitting things, always getting, we'd love to see more things from you in the future. I'd send things in the future. I wouldn't get anything back. I tried to write to editors. These are all just at magazines, mainly in the US and say like, hey, what, you know, what do you want from me? <laughs> and then of course they don't reply because they're scared as I was when I was an editor that then you just go into some kind of crazy like spiel and attack them and tell them, you know, well, how dare you not publish my genius? Anyhow, so I, I was kind of stuck and, and, and two, you know, I, I think I was, I was getting more open to trying something new because, you know, these rounded polished stories weren't quite right. And I was reading stuff and, you know, someone who's a, a young person trying to write that, that really influenced me. Like I, I went to, I went deep into a Nicola Barker phase <laughs> where I just read every Nicola Barker book I could find. I read Darkman's and I was like, this is great. And then got our short stories and like every, every single thing that she wrote. Um, and she just writes these really wacky and zany and self-indulgent kind of works, which get progressively more self-indulgent as they go. Um, and I was kind of thrilled by that stuff, like the freedom that she seemingly had, you know, and the way that she seemed not to necessarily care about reception, you know, and after you've gone through a long period of, of failing and being rejected, it, it feels really exciting to be, you know, I don't know, it's equivalent like, you know, dyeing your hair or something and, and, and wearing more aggressive clothes. You're like, well, you don't want me, I don't want you either. So, you know, you just start writing in a sillier kind of way. Um, and that was the kind of mid phase. I was also reading more and more at the time. He writes, you know, quite comedically, not always. Um, and then I guess the next change just came when I just got a bit older and the sort of things that were preoccupying me had shifted and, and in some ways life started to feel a little bit heavier. Um, but so there's a desire to, to write in a more serious way. Um, but then too, as I said, like not to lose the kind of verve of the earlier work. So trying to somehow pull this together. No, that, that, that makes sense. I think it's interesting to think of it as being a bit of a F you when it didn't go how you wanted it to and not going to do whatever I want anyway. Um, I'm not sure it reads exactly like that, but I, I'm going to go back and read it and try and see if I get that coming through. I think, I think the stuff that is most like that is not in here. That's still on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> didn't quite make the cut for the book. I guess I was really interested in how you talk about the characters as well. I feel like I read lots of short stories and the thing that I love about short stories and that I loved about this collection is that you have fewer words to kind of build kind of a world. And I guess you're kind of not building a massive world. You're just getting a really small snippet of it. Um, and I think it's, there's something really special and quite just must be incredibly hard to create this kind of tiny world that feels like it's part of something so much bigger. You kind of get to the end of the story and think, these characters are doing other things in spite of the fact that I've been with them for like 10 pages. Um, I, guess I wonder what what kind of is the, the process of creating characters for stories that you know are short and then are kind of, they, they're not going to go any further, they just end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I have a really inefficient process. <laughs> so I think it's forever to write. Um, and I get really frustrated with people and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I think maybe I just dwell with the characters for ages. So that story, The Ladder, which is the second story, um, even though I finished it like post deadline, I had been working on it for months and months and months. And the story, The Examination was similar. 
and they all usually start as something completely different than than what they are. Um, so the latter, for people who've read it or will go on to read it, began as a story about a guy who wakes up in the middle of the night and he has a buzzing noise outside of his window. He opens his curtains and there's a drone hovering outside um, and he doesn't know what it is and it just sits there for a long time and then disappears. And then over a series of nights, every night he hears this buzz and there's one more drone and another drone and another drone until like the entire like outside of his flat is just filled with drones which are just staring at him. That was the original idea for that story. That's absolutely not, and I might still write that sentence yet, that's absolutely not the story that you have. <laughs> um, but in trying to write that story, I decided he had a sister. And then I wrote lots of scenes with him and the sister having arguments and they didn't get along and they didn't have a great relationship. Um, and then I scrapped that because I felt it was too much like the scenes in that Steve McQueen movie, Shame, which is a fantastic movie about a brother's relationship. And then like when I was writing about him in the drone, he needed a job. So I needed to put, you know, what did he do during the daytime? So I invented this job for him. Loads of scenes with him and his colleagues talking, like conflicting, et cetera. I scrapped all of that. Then, you know, I was trying to work out. So, you know, what are these drones supposed to be? Like what's it related to? It was because he's trying to buy a house and he like, he was really scared about what was gonna happen. So I had all scenes of that. So these people have been like, I've lived, I've lived with them for a very long time. <laughs> like I've put them in lots of different places to see which place works. So insofar as it feels like they exist beyond, maybe that's just the, uh, a symptom of the fact that they really have existed in lots of other places for me. Um, and that kind of winnowing, you know, the story start is one thing and they move somewhere else and they get smaller and they get, you know, more honed. I think that winnowing out process like, helps me to focus about you know what I actually care about um, and what I cared about in that particular story was this person who for whatever reason was in a comfortable place but it wasn't comfortable that's what I really wanted to write about um, but like in that process I suppose it it necessarily comes leaner because I start thinking well that's not important that's not important that's not important um, and also you know as I said I just feel like I do create even if on the canvas is this landscape, the process has created a, a big landscape all around it, if that makes sense. And maybe, hopefully, or at least in your case, it seems like you're you're getting some sense of, you know, what's behind the tree or whatever. Yeah, I think it, it definitely feels like that that kind of you explain that process like it does make sense that I'm reading it and thinking that. I'm imagining the scene that came before it and all the scenes that could come after it. And I'm really sad when I get to the end of the story and it just ends and I don't know what's happening next. And I really want it to keep going. <laughs> I would say, like, Sorry. just to jump in really quickly, like I've been, so I teach Sartre's in my day job essay, What is Literature? Um, which I really adore and for people who don't know it. Um, it begins in like what I think is really a compelling premise and then it just gets a bit weird, but the, the compelling premise at the beginning is that literature is like an intersubjective exchange. It's something that a writer offers to a reader for the reader then to kind of concretize and complete. So the writing is only half of the process. And this is obvious, but it's, it's you know, I, I find it quite useful. The writing is only half of the process. What you're doing is you're, you're giving someone something to, to do something with, to actualize. And I kind of like what you just said. And I like the idea that, you know, almost I'm pro providing the sheet music for someone to play. And the way that you play it is your own and, and what you imagine, it, how you imagine it should sound or what happens afterwards or, you know, what comes next or what it really means, like that's that's yours. You know, I kind of give you an occasion to think about this thing. Um, so it's quite satisfying to know anyway, that that's how you, how you play this stuff. That's, that's really fascinating. I think I've, I listened to a podcast recently where that same similar thing was said of it being kind of, the book becomes the person that it's kind of given to, it becomes the readers and everybody has this different version of that book and you'll have your version. And then when I read it, the characters become something quite different and kind of transform into kind of however I'm reading them. I think it's a really, I think it's a really interesting way to think about it. And I think it's the way that makes the most sense for me when I think about what it feels like to read something, especially when you then compare it to someone else and they got to really different conclusion to you. Like, how did you read it like that? That's obviously <laughs> not the story about. 
that was a great so I was in a book club when I was I don't know in my mid-20s and that was such a useful thing for being a writer because you really realize that people are not you know you're starting from the you have a like a an objective starting point but the end point is completely subjective and what people see and what they miss and what's important what's not we read that Arthur and George by Julian Barnes, which to me is like obviously about racism <laughs> and, <laughs> or at points. And the people in the groups didn't see that at all. And that was, it was quite fascinating. But of course, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to chat, but of course, like you necessarily imagine things differently. How could you possibly, when you are thinking about the characters look like, the spaces they are, imagine the same thing the author imagined. That's just, it's an impossibility. Um, and that I think is kind of like where the magic of literature it's located if that's not too cheesy a thing to say. <laughs> I don't think it's too cheesy, but then maybe that's not, maybe somebody else would, but they, <laughs> they would just be wrong. They'd be wrong. Yeah. That's what we'll go with. <laughs> I, I guess this, this doesn't entirely relate, but maybe relates in some ways. Um, I kind of was wondering what it, I think I want to ask you about all the stories that you didn't include in this collection, but that would maybe be too long of a conversation. <laughs> but yeah. I wanted to ask you a bit more about the process of putting all the stories together um, and kind of, I guess you've talked a little bit already about what you wanted it to do like as a whole thing, but mm -hmm. just what that process was like of putting stories like you talked about examination and then the ladder being kind of coming from two different places and being different times and then figuring out what order you're going to put them in. Mm -hmm. What kind of, can you talk a bit more about what that process was like? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think, so my initial, um, pitch to, to the press, just trying to find the content. What had I written? I'd written the first and second story. Um, I'd written, um, I don't think I'd finished the last story. I think I'd written the, first, written the first and second story and then the two stories in the middle. And then the rest didn't exist. Um, I knew where I wanted to start. I knew that the first story was the first story. Um, I knew where I wanted to end. I think Rhodes' last story was almost finished at that time, but not quite finished. And I knew I wanted that to be the end. Um, and then a couple of stories, I, 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 I knew I wanted to write St. Sebastian Mounts Across. I had wanted to write it for many, many years and just had no reason to. Because <laughs> um, I knew it was going to be weird and I, I knew to send it to a magazine would be pointless. Um, so I knew I wanted to write that. I wasn't sure where it could fit. And I knew that the latter, as it was called Drones at that time, like had to have a certain mood, had a certain mood that might work well in the beginning. But I guess the assemblage was just thinking about what things felt good together. And a thing I picked up from the magazine was I would always read the very beginning and the very end of things to make sure that they kind of flowed. Um, so yeah, the way something concluded sort of naturally led to the beginning of something else. So once everything was written, there was a lot of sort of playing around with sequencing. There was one story which was very, very dear to me, also a relatively older story called Strip Malls that I didn't want to include in the collection, which I think would fit well, would have fit well. <laughs> um, but Emma didn't like it. She said it was too much like a traditional short story. Um, and it's probably the most traditional short story I've ever written, which is that it's very, very rounded, um, again, in that kind of New Yorker style, but she, she, it didn't really thrill her. And it's, um, but it's about where I grew up um, and kind of thinking about in Tampa, Florida, um, and thinking about the kind of kids I, I came up with, all completely fictional in the story. But yeah, it's a story very, very close to my heart. And unfortunately, it's still on the hard drive. So if anyone on the call wants a story, <laughs> I've got an extra one. Um, I, I definitely want to know. We've already got a response to say yes, that everybody <laughs> wants the actual story, of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually really glad that you mentioned the St. Stephen Mounts the Cross story. Um, yeah. I thought that one was the one where the form was the most different for me. Kind of, you, you play around with the form a lot, but kind of actually what it looks like on the page, the one where the title goes across the page and kind of feels like when I immediately open, it just felt like the most different. I guess mm -hmm. the one that is the most explicitly about actually writing. Yeah. Um, it feels like the question that everybody asks and is the basic question, and I apologize already, but how much of that was kind of you thinking about your writing experience okay. and then writing about somebody else, writing <laughs> about basically your writing experience in the book? <laughs> Um, it's the, it's the, it's a story that is explicitly, and I'm sorry, I think that you're talking about what kind of ruined the experience of reading it. So if people haven't read it, I apologize, but, um, I'll do as little as I can. Um, 
it's a story that is just because explicitly thinking about two modes of writing. Um, it was in the submission, one page with two columns. Um, and it is supposed to be, but I don't know that works as well in the book, that those are given to you, again, the kind of offering to the reader to do with what you want. Um, and each column is different, a different kind of story, but about the same thing, both are about writing, becoming a writer. Um, and I guess at some level, it is thinking about me as a writer. And again, that I've always kind of written in these two juxtaposed styles. Um, it's thinking about the industry. So what kinds of stories people want, um, especially in an era where auto fiction is, is kind of the thing, you know, many of our contemporary books, especially I had the awful experience of trying to, I forgot my copy of this book at home, which is silly. So I had to go and buy one, um, so I, I, um, which is fine. So um, I had the horrible experience of going to Waterstones to try to find my book. It wasn't there. So if you're anywhere near Waterstones, Gower Street, please tell them off um, when you visit folks. But um, having that experience of being in a bookshop and being like, there are so many books, like how is my little book ever gonna get found? Um, but looking at some of the new releases and there being a lot of like internet novels with eye narrators, which you read the author's biographies and you have a sense that this is someone who's really close to them. Um, and that seems to be the thing that the industry really wants at the moment, like something relatively close to your own experience and the author to be almost an avatar of the fiction that they've written. And um, so it's sort of thinking about that, thinking about trauma narratives and how they function and right? like doing lots of things and, and thinking about writing. So it's kind of intentionally a narrator that seems like it could be me, but it, but isn't, um, which is a part of that work. But it started with like really wanting to write a, it started out with form. So I wanted to try to write something that was like a Mobius strip um, and was thinking about how you could do that in two dimensions on a page. Um, and and that's what I was attempting. And I, 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 it feels weird to say about your own work, but I really love it. Like it's, again, one of these things that's really close to my own heart. But also again, I don't know if it works. And I, and I know that no one re will read it the way that I read it. Um, but yeah, that's it. And it's funny title is a, a, a kind of a, a misreading of the title of a song that I really like as well. So it's, like, it's a very much my story, but for you. I really like that idea. I think that the way that when I read it, I read it as kind of like in a movie when you someone starts talking about something in the past and then you split into the past and then you watch the past for a bit and then it like goes into the future. And like, oh, I was like, I was just getting into that. I'd really like it. <laughs> and then you go back again and I kind of, maybe not exactly the same as how you're imagining it, but I think an element of that has definitely remained with it for me and for how I was kind of reading it. I think that maybe now we've got about 15 minutes would be a good time for you to give us a final reading if you would like. Okay, sure. Um, I right. will so, here again. <laughs> thank you. There are two options for this that I've played with what I should read. The second story, The Ladder, is written in a first person. First person. It's quite easy to read um, in that voice. Uh, it's a kind of New York ease voice when I read it, but I decided to read the story that feels like the zany outlier, which is White Wedding, which we've been talking about before. So it's gonna read the first, I think, two sections of that, because um, it's a story that's broken up into, if you can see this, it's not blurry, um, sections and headings. So I'm just gonna have a little bit of water first. All right, so this is um, White Wedding. The first problem was the Botox. The goal had been for the bride to get a small touch just above her left eyebrow, which in times of crisis had the tendency to betray her with a tick. Unfortunately, a dog had just been at the salon an hour before she arrived. The woman administering the shot did the eyebrow fine but suggested perhaps one further dose above the bridge of the nose, you know, preventatively. The bride said yes, fixed her face, then sneezed the whole needle to the hilt into her tear duct. She returned home six hours later to the flat she shared with the groom. The whole left side of her face and the, le uh, the whole left side of her head frozen, immobile, drooping, baby, baby skin smooth. You could wear a mask, he suggested. The second problem was the best man, Stanley. He'd been instructed by email, text message, and several face-to-face -face pub conversations 
that certain topics were off limits for his speech. A, he was not to tell the truth about how the bride and groom first met at a sex party organized by the Free Love Society at their university. He was not to say, especially, that he met the bride there first, then the groom, and that fluids had been exchanged between the three of them in combinations none could remember because, as they found out afterwards, the FLS spiked both the food and the drinks at all their events with any drug they could find. B, he was not to talk about the groom's feet, which were massive, hook-nailed, atrocious things that he'd worked hard to hide from the bride's family and friends for five years, at all costs, pursuing wild and contortionate stratagems to shield them at beach parties, on holidays, and after getting rain-soaked several times to the bone. The best man, Stanley, had said he would be respectful of the groom's feet, but he had, he had a good riff that he'd thunk up about different things he could compare them to, like toes like pizza crusts, nails like sausage skins, and things like that. All food stuffs the bride and groom as vegans didn't eat, he'd said. And he'd weave that into comments about their veganism, how it's trendy now, something about quinoa. And then he'd spin that out into something endearing about how he loved them both and wished them well. That was kind of his outline. No, definitely not, the groom said, because C, he was not to talk about veganism. It was simple. The subject was touchy with family at the best of times. The groom's father had had a 26 hour row with him spread across two weeks and six days about serving vegan food only at the reception. During the course of which the groom's father called vegans, quote, a Scientology like cult, a bunch of psychopathic bastards and deontologists. The last insult giving them both pause and leading to a mutually agreed termination of the argument so both could rest and take stock. Veganism, said the groom, is an ethical lifestyle, but one predicated. He said that, predicated, and Stanley took out his phone, opened notes, and typed it, predicated, and, as an aide memoir added, always talks funny. Predicated on an implicit denunciation of the way that others lived. The bride, said the groom, was always offended by his veganism for that reason when they met. At the time, she believed in live and let live, but after watching some videos of abattoirs with him on date seven or so, she was swayed. In general, he said, unless they were soulless, people knew that eating meat was evil. That's why chicken nuggets exist, he said definitively. Didn't explain, cracked his knuckles, and ended. So, no veganism. That's it. I think that was a great place to end it. I really love that <laughs> line. Uh, do, you, do you have an answer for that with the, the that's why chicken nuggets ended? Or <laughs> no, where, where does that go? Do you, do you know what that's supposed to be? <laughs> No, no, that's 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 for you to interpret. <laughs> I think that is, yeah, I think that's just a really brilliant, a really brilliant story. I think that the first time that I read that, my sister was actually wedding planning, and so it made it even better in that context that I was already getting all of her wedding craziness, and then read this and was like, this is just great. It's just, yeah, it's just brilliant. Thank you. Out of interest, which which of the stories do you think is your favorite? Oh gosh. Um if you can pick one. I'll accept maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't I think I might not be able to pick one. Um yeah, they all they all kind of do different things for me, I suppose. So yeah, and I think the process of putting the book together as anyone who's put a book together has experienced people who, who will go on to do so. Um, I don't know, you, you're with it so many times, you read so many drafts, you do so many proofs. Um, over time, it really just started to feel to me like a whole, you know, like pulling out any individual story isn't, isn't really it. Like the thing, the book is Parables, Fables, and Nightmares, and it's composed of multiple nine different parts, but all those parts make Parables, Fables, Nightmares, if that makes sense. So like, yeah, I don't know. To me, it feels it feels unified. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I like them all. Um, I'll I'll accept that answer. In spite of the fact there wasn't a favorite, <laughs> that I think I'll accept the answer. <laughs> um, I think that we'll now go to a Q and A. And so, if anyone has any questions, there is a Q and A function, or feel free to put the questions in the chat for us. Um, we did actually get emailed a question today um, by Molly, who I think is in the chat. Um, she asked, do you have a favorite fable? That was an excellent question. So I'll hand that one over to you. Oh gosh, good one. Um, uh, I think the one that, so I had a little Aesop book of fables um, when I was a kid growing up. I don't remember them ever being read to me, but I, I, read, I read some of them. Um, 
And the one that's really stuck with me because the, the moral is so strange is the, um, what is it? The frog and the scorpion, which is where a scorpion asks a frog. So uh, a scorpion kind of comes to a, a river and can't cross. And he asks the frog to give him a, a ride across. And he promises the frog he won't sting him. He just wants to get to the other side. Can you help him out? So the frog says, sure. The scorpion jumps on his back. And then when they're halfway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog and they both drown. And the moral was like certain things like are just the way that they are and they can't help it. <laughs> and it was like completely baffling to me <laughs> as a kid um, because it was, you know, I don't know, just don't don't trust things, people who look dodgy. <laughs> it's like the moral. Um, so yeah, that's that's the fable that, that I've brought with me through life and kind of questions as I've moved life. I don't think I've ever heard that fable before. But, yeah. That's normally they end and it's like and this is why you're supposed to treat people kindly, <laughs> why you're supposed to share, not just Things are how they are. Get on with it. We had very strange. We also had a grim, grim fairy tales book with the the actual original versions of like children being mutilated and killed and things. Like that. I don't really know. I remember that one. My mother did read to me, and I remember her reading one, which is a boy has like a scythe, and he's um getting wheat in, and then this is like in the first page, he like lops his own leg off or something like that because he swings the scythe, and she just is like, ah, oh, okay, we're not doing that. <laughs> That, so, yeah. that doesn't sound like good bedtime reading. <laughs> that, that's definitely going to give you nightmares. Yeah, but very, very <laughs> I think I used to watch uh, like gruesome bedtime stories, or I can't think what it was called now. And that always gave me nightmares, and I always continue to watch it, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we've got a question from Georgie who asked, Do you get to teach your own book now? <laughs> Theoretically, I could. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think I will. Um, but I guess I guess I could. Uh, I, I, uh, I guess a like, sort of weird answer to that is in in the years of trying to write, I've gone to lots of creative writing things, did a master's in creative writing, did an adult education course in creative writing, and did little odd, odds and ends. And it was always really strange. So from time to time, you have course administrators who like give you abstracts of their own work. And it's extremely awkward. Like you don't really know what you're supposed to do with that because if you like it and you say, oh, I really loved it. Like it seems like weird and sycophantic. If you really don't, like if you don't like it, then what do you do? Like you're in like an extraordinarily awkward place for the span of time that you're looking at the thing. It's just, yeah, it's 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 not a good scene. So I don't think, I don't think it's something that I will do. Do you do that with your like non-fiction? Will you yeah. do kind of teach like well I guess not necessarily teacher but share any of that and get students to read it I really don't know I don't I, I mean I had one student who who quoted me um this year and it was so strange you know as Macintosh said I just don't I just it's just very strange I find it all very 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 odd um yeah so no I don't if they find it themselves it's, it exists um but yeah <laughs> too weird. Oh, that very interesting. I do always find it weird doing that, like writing and you're like, you're going to read this and I've just put your name there and I kind of want to put in brackets, like I know this is you and I'm now talking about you in a way yeah. that's not really detached, but it's, also... it's, really, it's really weird. I mean, it was completely, completely relevant um, and it made sense and it was exactly related to what the student was working on and that was all fine. Um, and it wasn't sycophantic, it was kind of critical, which was perfectly fine too. Um, but yeah, it is weird. It just, again, it just feels a bit awkward. It's perfectly normal and I think sometimes necessary with an academic sphere where like you're the only person who's written about something, but it's a little bit weird. Maybe I'll get used to it one day. <laughs> it may, maybe not anytime soon, get somebody else to teach it instead. We've got <laughs> yeah. um, a couple more questions. We've got a question from Paul Howarth. He said, hey Malachi, congratulations. And yeah. asked, how do you choose where to end your stories? Is it organic or do you pre- Plan. Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, and hello, Paul. I'm Paul. Um, uh, organic. And I think when my move to less sort of neat stories, which I would plot out quite, you know, thoroughly, I've moved to a style where everything I do with my writing is 
I kind of try more and more to allow it to be a kind of different way of being, if that makes sense and doesn't sound too weird and mystical, um, where I really try to write and just see how I respond quite viscerally to what I've written to determine if it's right or not um, and try not to overthink it. And I think that probably links a little bit back to the previous question about my day job. I think my worst writing was when I was a newly employed academic and I was writing stories and wrote a novel as if, as if I was teaching it. So, you know, what are the symbols in this one? Red in this story is going to be blah, blah, blah. And this person has a hat, that means this. And like, you know, thinking like an academic, um, which is just results in these really kind of desiccated, schematic, like awful things because writers don't, I don't think, most writers don't create their work in the way that it's read. Um, so having to wean myself off of that took a really long time and, and where I am now, which seems to be working, um, I got a clutch out of it anyway, is, is just trying to just follow my gut as much as possible. Um, and with endings, it, it usually is just a point where it feels right. Um, and I just, you know, I try not to question that. Yeah. I think that's a great answer. Are there, have you ever kind of continued writing and then thought, no, it should have stopped earlier? Um, you know, not that I can recall. Like, I think for some reason, I don't know, again, talking about this novel I'm working on now, because it's literally just on the desk as well. Um, I, 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 I think I can do endings all right. Like I think endings are like a thing. Like beginnings, I I tend not to change too much. Certainly the first paragraph, and endings I tend not to mess with too much. But obviously, as I said, my process is such that it takes me forever to actually get to an end. It's possible I'm just exhausted. I don't care anymore. <laughs> um, but no, I don't. I don't really often revise endings that much. I guess well with this book I have, but much less than the novel, much less than the rest of it. So. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I tend. I think I tend not to like run beyond. I, I, it, it, it these things find a way to wrap themselves up. Mm. Very nice answer. I think we have just one more question, which is from Helen Cross. So Helen asked, "How did it feel to let these stories go to publication, having lived with them for so long?" Um, she said that she finds stories a kind of very private thing, and is oddly not so hugely bothered about publishing them, and almost doesn't want to let them go and just wants to fiddle with them forever. Oh, really? It felt amazing. It felt so good. I can't even put it in words. Like, you know, I'm blushing in my terrible light. Um, It was great. I've been trying to do something like this for so long. I left home at 21 to be a writer, to write fiction. Um, And at 22, I had my first publication. So I was like, yeah, OK, 23, I'll be famous. I'll be the next Zadie Smith. Um, fast forward 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have this first collection of fiction um, and it was wonderful. Like I, I started, I had the desire to put this together over the pandemic when things were very bleak. Um, I was at home with my wife and small child, a son um, in like this tiny flat. The whole world felt like it was falling apart. And I said, I thought like, let me go back to all this fiction on my hard drive and try to put something together almost like as the last thing, you know, back in the in the periods when thousands of people were dying every day and nobody even knew how you could get it when we were like washing our Amazon packages and things like this. Um, I just wanted to have, like for my son, the books dedicated to my son, something that I didn't expect to get published that could show him that this was the thing that I had tried to do in my life. Um, and like, this was a goal that I had tried to aim myself at when I was like in my early twenties, <laughs> like this is what your dad was up to. Um, so it being printed was just like incredible. I mean, it being accepted and then like looking at final proofs and I was a very much perfectionist with those. So apologies to everyone at Amapra. Um, yeah, just incredible. It seems absolutely incredible. Um, and the book wasn't at Waterstones, but it was at the ICA gallery and just kind of seeing it there alongside everybody else's stuff. Yeah, it was great. So it's pretty fantastic. Well, Helen said, well, that's wonderful. Um, I think I agree that was a really great answer. I think maybe I, I'm not a writer, but maybe I would feel like I don't want to let it go. It feels like a, it's very nice to hear that letting it go is the, the best bit of all of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best bit, yeah. <laughs> I think that, that leads me to, I guess, my last question, then we'll wrap things mm -hmm. up, which is what has been your favourite thing about this whole process, kind of 
wherever you want the process to be and whether that's at 21 or or kind of as you were accepted <laughs> and kind of actually putting it together what's been the best bit um it's hard to say i really enjoy working on the cover with um uh, an artist named mark weber i think might have been on the cover might, might not be on it anymore um which was good fun it reminded me of working in a magazine and putting covers together um aha uh, there he is hi mark um yeah, that was pretty cool. And I'm really happy with, with how it came out. And that was like, it felt like a, a really nice like exchange and and felt like it wasn't ultimately, but felt like the last thing to just kind of like put a cap on everything. Um, but maybe the absolute best part was when I, s- I submitted it initially to Emma and then she wanted to chat to me about it. So said like, do you want to meet in a cafe and, and talk about it? And like, again, with my history of rejections, I expected it to be like, well, you know, it's nice or whatever, but, <laughs> um, but it was like, yeah, I like these three. I don't like these two, what else do you have? And mm-hmm. like, that was like, yeah, there was hope, you know? Um, and that, that was probably the best part when it felt like it, it could happen. Um, yeah, that was the best part. That was, that was an excellent answer. Um, and I imagine that Emma will be watching this at, at some point if not right now and we'll, we'll very much like that you said that as well um we have lots of people in the chat asking they really like the cover I would love the cover as well I think that it's fantastic um and it looks really great on my bookshelf it's also really great to read obviously but it's always nice when you have a book that looks as good as it is to read it <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we are we're officially running over, so I think we'll have to wrap things up now. But it's been so amazing getting to talk to you about this book. I have so so many more questions, and um, so you might get a really long email from me with all the things <laughs> I wanted to ask you, but couldn't because I don't think everyone wants to just sit here while I ask questions. Um, but thank you, yeah, thank you so much for 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 letting me be a part of this and get to talk to you about it and for writing this book. And congratulations for finally having the book out in the world as well. <laughs> thank you can I just say thanks to a few people before we go yeah of course um because on this very 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 long and winding path to publication and who knows if there'll ever be another book um I just there are people who have supported me and kind of believed in my strange writing and kept me going um and I just wanted to thank them because without them I would have given up a long time ago um so in no particular order well the one person first um, is Jane Kamein, who's the director of Nine Arches Press, was the first person to accept and publish my work in England and made me think, okay, maybe I can write for an English audience. So thank you to Jane. Jonathan Davidson of Writing West Midlands, who over many years had mentoring conversations with me about my work. And my teachers, Helen Cross, Andrew Cowan, and Miranda Doyle, um, who again sort of helped me keep writing. Um, and then I think maybe lastly, Kavita Bana, who published my first story in an actual book, which is the Bur- book of Birmingham. Um, and that was at a particularly low point in the whole writing career um, and kind of spurred me on. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, without without that support, not this. And obviously it's failures are not anybody else's failures. Um, but whatever is good in this is, is as much me as, as, as others. So thank you very much for y'all. What a, what a brilliant way for us to end. I'm hoping that you can see the messages that are coming into the chat. Um, there are some really lovely messages. Lots of people saying thank you um, to you. And yeah, lots of lots of very nice congratulations too. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Well, I think we'll, we'll end it there then. So thank you again, Malachi, for coming. And thank you everyone who joined us this evening and listened to us talk about the book and let me indulge in all the questions I wanted to get to ask you as well. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for, for chairing. Well, have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye.